Today, we're going to be talking about how and why the electric bass began to move past its traditional tone and role inherited from Motown, rock and roll, and how the equipment and technique changed with it. So Rodney, when we talk about Geezer Butler, one of the interesting things about his sound is the pioneer, how he pioneered his sound was with guitar amplifiers, especially um, during the first Black Sabbath record. He used a Laney 100 watt tube amp that he borrowed off of Tony Iommi. And um, I know there's an interesting connection there with The Who. What do you think? Definitely. Uh, just to backtrack a little bit on it, uh, something I think we're really seeing here is uh, Butler and and Twistle and guys like this, I think, are where we're starting to see the evolution of electric bass being a, an electric imitation of the stand-up and its traditional root moving into the birth of bass guitar as we think of it now. And it's kind of funny that the crossover happens even in the gear and that so many of these guys were using guitar amps because they just didn't have something that was going to give them that push and be able to compete. You know, it's a uh, basis kind of get the same thing today and we're always a little bit behind in gear and, you know, a set, an afterthought sometimes, but it's a lot better than it was. But yeah, a lot of the early gear, I think, uh, was a crossover that bassists were using a lot of guitar gear. And the funny thing being with Entwistle is he pushed that sound even further. And a lot of people don't know, and it's kind of an irony, the stack in the way that we think of it, like the guitar amp, you know, the 412, the big wall of cabinets, that was originally a design that Entwistle commissioned from High Watt to get him a bigger sound to compete with Pete Townsend. And then Townsend became jealous of it, and then he wanted one, as guitar players always seem to, and <laughs> he took that. So it's kind of funny that bass players went into guitar gear starting in this evolution and then guitar players wound up getting their seminal piece of gear for what 60 years out of turning a bass amp into something that was perfectly suited for guitar and then the gear and the technique and the sound start evolving from that point i think these those two players can't be credited enough really for being the birthplace of what we think of as modern metal and rock bass guitar mm, i agree I find it interesting how the, I wouldn't say limitations of the equipment, but the way that the equipment worked, so in terms of the guitar amplifier, it gave you a very specific bass tone. So you had to play a certain way, maybe not the same as a rhythm guitar. It gave you almost a certain frequency band where you would excel at. Yeah, I, I get that totally. And again, it's a lot of it comes down to the introduction, I think, of, you know, what's blown up in modern time, but the idea of gain. You know, you have the initial guitar amps introducing distortion and gain, and bass amps had to follow suit, or bass players had to. And I think this shows in the technique too. If you watch uh, someone like uh, Butler and Entwistle, a lot of guys would used to play back by the bridge, even in rock and rockabilly, to get uh, you know, a tighter, more focused sound and provide that more round, punchy tone. And these guys are basically over the fingerboard. They're actually hitting the frets, trying to get that upper end ring. They want that cut and the clank and that type of thing that so many players are after now. And they adjusted their technique to almost literally be smacking against the frets, kind of the predecessor to slap bass in a way, to get more upper end out of what was going on. And as you see, like with Entwistle later, he took this, you know, beyond anybody at the time, you know, using two different channels and uh, distortion on one end and, you know, practically used all four of his fingers as kind of slap bass tools. But, yeah, I think you're, you're definitely right there in that it was part technique and part gear. And you see them having to react to what was going on with guitar. And then you see the birth of bass guitar as we know it uh now do you know anything about butler as far as when he although he used that in the studio what amps he grew into using later or what helped get him that sound that was more bass focused or if he just kept on with a guitar rig or how that worked out so funny enough with geezer butler he he kept on to delaney's well into the mid 70s so 
One of the most seminal performances of Black Sabbath was the Cow Jam Festival in 1974. And on that gig, he had three Laney 100 watt guitar heads, as well as a whole range, I think it was up to six or seven JBL custom cabinets with JBL speakers, as well as two Crown power amps and powering two bass bins. He went from a very fo focused guitar tone to booming loud volume instead. So going right from tone straight to volume. Wow. So, I mean, he's basically half guitar amp, half PA column there at a certain uh, point. Well, yeah. Um, he basically went full on PA. And I can't remember if he was trying to rival Iomi or something, but um, yeah, he just went volume for some reason. That was his thing. Volume. <laughs> Yeah, I, and that's always been it, I guess, is the loudness war in between guitar and bass. It seems to swing back and forth. And I think it's not just that kind of ego thing, but you're you're starting to see the birth of that competition. You know, it's bass was traditionally the background. It wasn't meant to interfere with vocal or melody or anything else. And now you're seeing this constant competition, even to go to like end whistle and stuff and uh, the anecdote about... Townsend taking his amp and him wanting the same, it's there. It becomes a rivalry that the bass moves yeah. up to the point where it's still a supportive role, but it's stepping so far into guitar territory. There's this constant back and forth of who's going to stand out the most and is anybody going to get overpowered? Mm. So it's interesting as well, where in comparison to John Entwistle, he too, um, I've only listened to it a little bit, but from what I've read, he also had a massive PA stack, pretty much. Um, I need to bring up the notes to show you what I found, but it's basically, I think it's up to 16 um, speakers in one of his cabs, just huge cabinets. Yeah. And again, loudness, just, I don't know, for, for some reason, just to be loud. And whether it's to rival the guitar, the guitar player, or I don't know, ego, who knows? Sure. <laughs> I think too, you're seeing, uh the evolution of rock in itself. And uh, it's occurring to me as uh, we're talking about this, that rock's birth expanded out. It's kind of like the universe. It went out in a number of different ways. You're seeing because rock got so much bigger, it necessi necessitated the electric amp so that you could amplify it. And the bigger these bands got, that they had to start playing even stadiums or these huge places, the need for these massive guitar amps and bass amps and PA columns meant these early guys were having to innovate and it was, we're starting to play bigger places. We have to be able to broadcast to these people and in the same volume that the people up front are used to getting hit with. We can't treat it like yeah. it's 200 people now. There's a few thousand. And before you have these massive array PAs and things, it's you want to be a bass player that's heard you better have a pa system for your bass and so that that kind of you know swirling innovation and borrowing back and forth goes into that too because rock's becoming such a force in the industry and the the preeminent music i guess around the world that's a good point and i think um it's almost like volume becomes an instrument in and of itself it's like you can feel this like you can you know, you feel it in your stomach, you feel it in your gut. This is the music rather than just hearing it off of a headphones or a speaker. And I don't know if you heard that story about the Beatles when they played, I think it was Yankee Stadium for the first time. They had no amplifiers. They only had their cabinets on stage. So there was no PA, it was just them. Nobody could hear them because all of, all of the, the fans were screaming. And they're like, why are we playing? Like, we can't hear ourselves. So there was that, like you said, that innovation to keep building to make sure that everyone can hear you in a stadium that's uh it, it, we're i'm jumping ahead a little bit to modern technology which we'll get to later but it's really interesting that you say that and you're dead on with saying that the volume itself becomes an instrument it's especially because rock introduced deeper sounds bigger bass big you know thunderous drums there is a very primal part of it that becomes important and being able to really hit people with that. I know as far as myself and a number of other bass players, now that you have uh, more minimized rigs, people using in-ear monitors, one of the 
biggest complaints I hear from bass players and one I have myself that I love the idea of an in-ear monitor and the clarity and everything, but there's something about feeling that moving air from a bass amp that you just still want. And I don't know how much I would ever be able to let go of that because I mean, like even behind me, you'll get, you know, this Mesa 412 cabinet. Um, it, it just not feeling when I hit a low B string or something, that thing, it makes my you know back just go forward. Having that minimized, I feel takes away from the experience. So yeah, it is part of my instrument, you know, moving okay. air is always still going to be part of it. And the funny thing is, it's even though I know the people out front are getting it from the PA, I still need it, need it to feel like I'm playing effectively and I'm not hearing myself right if I don't feel it. So that's, that's a really fantastic and accurate point that I can say from my own experience and the same complaint I hear from other bass players. They're like, I hear myself great. I don't feel a damn thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it really starts to bother them. Uh, I think... Uh, so apart from the loudness war, that definitely came into play for both of them. And these guys really, I think we're, and I'd be interested to hear your comments on this too, is as far as I can remember, these are the guys who started stepping bass forward in places where you just weren't hearing it before. And I think it was because it became also because of volume, a viable thing. Uh, like the most obvious example being the stuff like the intro to NIB with mm -hmm. Butler and he's using not just, you know, a guitar amp and the gain and the new bass sound, but him starting to go, hey, I can use effects like a guitar player too. That pedal was a, a Tyco, I need, to, I need to remember it properly, Tyco Brawa pedal, something like that, very old pedal oh. from the 70s. And if I remember rightly, I only had one. And he was playing with it. And he said, I want one too. Mm -hmm. As they do, you know, like, I want one. So he had that. And if I remember rightly, he kept that for decades. He didn't give that up. Maybe up until recently where he had the, um, the custom made Dunlop wire. But even on in many performances, you'll still see that pedal. And, you know, it sounds brilliant. You can't compare it to anything else. And again, the, the showing that crossover that it was becoming so prominent that he's they're sharing effects they're sharing amps they're sharing mm -hmm. tonal range that that it becomes you know kind of two sides of a coin Definitely. that i've always said that uh or at least my thought on it was when it comes to especially in rock guitar and bass is that a guitar plays melodically and thinks rhythmically as far as rhythm and then the bass player plays rhythmically and thinks melodically mm. so it's like he's adding note value to the drums basically and the guitar player is trying to add note value to the overall rhythm mm. of the song structure and they're all kind of meeting in this who's stepping on who at the middle point that hopefully becomes you know a uh, locked in at a center and not everybody fighting for the same turf. Do you think that the the medium, so I guess in that day it was vinyl, do you think the medium limit, it, it limited how deep the the band would record and play at? So for example, there wouldn't be a lot of bass range, it would all be mid-range. And vinyl was more predominantly mid-range, I guess. And that I guess that's why they were trying to meet in the middle, to say, well, I'll take this end, you take that end. And it sort of plays out better on vinyl. Sure, sure. I think uh, much like the other stuff that we're talking about, there's a number of factors that start kind of swirling around an area. Is if uh, the the observation, and I think we talked about this once before, that most of these bassists that we're talking about are doing this innovation are coming from bands that only have one guitar player. So the bassist almost filling a dual role of being a secondary guitar and the traditional bass role. So they're making that crossover. The other being that sound, you know, that was where sound was really heavy bass. It just wasn't a part of a public consciousness or music at that point. Uh, the only thing I could think would be like the toms and big band jazz or something would have something that deep, but it just wasn't there yet. And I think gear becomes part of that too. Like you're saying with, there just wasn't enough power, you know, to, to add massive bass to something requires an incredible amount of wattage because you, 
you know, th there's a reason why a guitar amp is a hundred and a bass amp is a thousand. It yeah. takes so much more push. And when these guys are barely being heard as it is, trying to put out a wall of bass sound just isn't going to happen. And, you know, it's like, okay, I, you know, I turn this up to a certain point and I'm ripping through the speakers or it's just turning to <laughs> turning the cabinet to dust. So it's, I think it's part innovation, part, it hadn't been invented yet in part, just physical limitation. You know, uh, if they're building these huge, you know, PA systems to try and compensate, they're just still not at a level that can broadcast the level of bass that we're used to hearing now. Uh, now, on that note, when these other players who start kind of picking up on the sound and stuff, and it, this starts to lead more into the 70s and some other players, uh, I feel like guitar kind of, in a weird way, from what I can see, almost stopped innovating at a certain point. Like once mm. the stack was stolen from us. <laughs> <laughs> that they just fell in love with it and that became the thing. It's like that goes on to Hendrix, it goes on to Jimmy Page, it goes on, you know, all these guys. And bass amps become this weird place of just kind of what can we pull out of things, you know? Uh, so it, it's kind of interesting to me that, it, that there's a lot of turmoil, like it, bass was evolving so much that you just start seeing, you know, 15s coming up or 18s live or like the PA cabinets and things like that. Uh, I've In a number of your episodes, like I've seen early bass players and stuff, it seems like there's always this constant experimentation, even to this day, with different size speakers, different size cabinets, things like that. Uh, did you, or what are your thoughts about that kind of innovation, how much was going on early on as far as people really swapping out options versus maybe what goes on now? I think a lot of it was uh, limited to what was available at the time. And what you'll find is a lot of people, I can think of Cliff Burton uh, as one, they were taking bass bins for PAs and using them as amplifiers. Or even Gears of Butler, like we said earlier, where bass bins seem to be that well they would split their signal into a higher range and a low range so the bass bins would have a lower range and then it would have like 12s or 15s for their upper range so cliff cliff burton was a pioneer of that doing that for himself uh, even going as far as having an a b rig for each pickup i, th I think well getty lee uh, is well known for doing that he would have an a rig with the high end and a b rig with the low end through different pickups uh, Billy Sheehan, same thing, yeah. uh, running out two rigs. Uh, it's it's interesting too, and and maybe your thought on the again something else that's kind of occurring to me is, you see, guitar players are you know they once they locked into kind of the four twelve or something, they've always focused on one central sound, and like you say with Butler that he's using the guitar amp and PA cabinets. And Twistle later goes to guitar rigs and uh, having subs as well and using distortion on the top end. Uh, Chris Squire, who comes later, same type of thing. He was using guitar amps and bass amps. It seems like the idea of a bi-amp type of setup or having multiple sources to make up for that idea, it's reinforcing that concept that bass turned into kind of a two-phase instrument that you've got to have a guitar presence and you've got to have a bass presence and it's almost like this big flashing sign going this is an instrument that plays two roles you know it's <laughs> uh like i remember uh and later on when biamp rigs became really big again in the 80s it was looked at like a new innovation and it's like this is what the early guys pioneered and it was part, I think, part to fill the role, and you see the birth of bass guitar, and part to be able to play bass, but also just be heard and have a presence up in that range. Uh, do you remember maybe what some earliest, some of the earlier examples of maybe the introduction of distortion in bass, or some uh, lines like even NIB has a little bit of it in there with the yeah, wah, you've got some tone. One of the earliest appearances of distortion was Geezer Butler. 
kind of, where he used a a 4x12 part cabinet, but one of the speakers were missing. So it was essentially a 3x12. And this was powered through the Laney 100 watt head. And apparently some or all of those speakers were broken as well. So he had this very distorted cabinet. And as far as I know, I don't know whether he kept that cabinet or not, but it was an impetus for him to find that sound. And it's also, it's very similar to The Who. I think it was The Who, who uh, they were known for cutting their amplifier cones with razor blades to try and get that distorted sound. And it's most prevalent on my generation. That's, that's in most documentaries and literature, that's one of the first instances of distortion. And some people like to say that it's the, the birthplace of metal way back when, because it's just how you get the overdrive. But, you know, many other musicians are known for that as well. So it's, it might just be, there, might not be. Yeah, that or they just found it by accident because exactly. gear was way more expensive and you just played it to <laughs> death. Isn't it kind of funny that with the amount of boutique gear out and things now, like a, a speaker is considered like, you know, a, a creasing on it or anything like that. Oh, it's terrible. It's this. But then we'll buy these $400 distortion units trying to imitate the sound <laughs> of what these guys did, which that's a whole other topic and maybe for another one. But uh, I feel like that's something with this early innovation that's getting lost now is the necessity of finding new tones because you have to. Exactly. That's that's quite an important point where a lot of artists just say, you know, we use what we had. This is all we had. So if it was broke, we're going to use it. We're going to have to incorporate it. And I think I think a lot of that notion is missing from a lot of music where it's broken. I get a new one. Like there's none of that sort of experimenting to see what range of sounds you can get from it. Exactly. Um... And again, it goes a little aside, but I think it does inform the evolution of bass and what was happening with it is that's why I think like the 60s and 70s are still looked at as such a time of incredible experimentation it's because they didn't have anything. You know, they they can't, you know, go onto Amazon and have something shipped directly to their door and it's this big and if they don't like it, they can exchange it. It's like you made an investment. Your career is going through this amp. You, you exactly. if you can't fi find the sound out of it, you better find the sound out of it. You, you know, modification of amps and all that type of thing. That makes a, a humongous difference. Uh, now, do you know of any examples? And I'm not well researched enough on this to know. I know a little bit later some of the stuff that comes in, but if any bassists were starting to get to the point where they were modifying their basses or the electronics in them to start changing sound as well. Most prominently was Cliff Burton who modified his bass, um, usually through pickups, where he had a, a secret weapon in the bridge of his bass, which was a Seymour Duncan pickup. And on his bass, he modded it to have a, a secret switch that would engage this pickup and almost add like a bit more of a bite from a guitar, as well as his, the, the, the Gibson Mudbucker. So we had the low end and then the, the single coil in the, in the middle of the bass and of course the guitar pickup. So given this full spectrum of range between bass, the, the bite from a uh, single coil, and then maybe like the high toppy frequencies of a guitar pickup. And he used that to great effect in Metallica, especially on his solos where it just had a different range that no one heard before. And I think in terms of mod modding the amplifiers, the one that's, that stands out for me is Lemmy, where he's well known for, well, it's a secret what he done, but he's well known to be modding his martial heads. And there was a very interesting story where they had a new tech or something when they were recording. I need to check out which album, but they were recording and the tech realized that Lemmy's amplifier was dirty or a lot of the connections were faulty and not right. He decided he was gonna take it upon himself to clean it and put it back to how it should be. So he essentially made the amplifier stock. And then I can't remember who it was, but somebody pointed it out, Lemmy's modded that, you don't wanna to touch it. 
And so he somehow managed to cobble it all back together how Lemmy had it, but it was never, it never sounded the same again. And Lemmy was pretty pissed off about that. <laughs> you can imagine a yeah, trademark sound. Uh, and again, this, this stuff moves forward, but I think it shows how, in a strange way, that this birth of uh, metal and rock bass in this era, the it kind of the baby at birth, it just kept going. Uh, one of uh, one of the similar to Burton and early examples I can think of would be like Billy Sheehan with him getting the Gibson pick up in the neck and then him wiring the P bass separate from that and all the mods he did to that and actually running a stereo jack like a Rickenbacker mm. to run out to two different amps this still pursuit and he was doing it you know in the 70s so you know even back then he was already you know it, it was like I guess you, they had already messed with the amps as far as you could go and having guitar and bass and everything. It's The next level is getting a knife and hacking into your instrument. But uh, every time the guitar leveled up, the bass had to do something to move along with it. And, uh, and it is kind of funny when we think about going back to the Entwistle thing that these 12 cabinets and everything being made for him, that then you see later players like Lemmy or even more recently, like uh, Steve Harris, using these 412 cabinets, and they're looked at like, what the hell are you doing? That's a guitar amp. It's like, no, <laughs> they're doing exactly what they got. Yeah, this was ours first. And it's funny how something can change that much, that an innovation that's born during this era gets taken by another instrument, and now it's looked at the same way as, you know, like it's, something that of course is just associated with guitar but it was born from bass and i can think of a, a another one that goes in the opposite direction is like the fender basement amps you know it's like now every guitar player uses them they were originally bass amps and yeah. so even even the people during this era creating the amps and doing the engineering didn't have a lockdown of what the end purpose would be. You know, they're experimenting and sending it out and it winds up serving a completely different purpose where it was meant for bass players to be able to cut and have more gain and do all this stuff and have uh, more channel options. The bass players wind up never using it really and the guitar players, it becomes a classic that's been used on you know tens of thousands of recordings even to this day, people go back and use basements. Yeah. So, uh, so, there are these two pieces of innovation coming up. There's one that applies to the instrument and one coming from a completely different part of the instrument's overall sound. And that'll kind of push us into the 70s and the next step in metal and bass and rock uh, bass guitar evolution. Those two things will be on episode two, which you can catch over at my channel, put that down here. But in the meantime, let's see if you can guess. You guys that are history and gear nerds like we are, and somebody just wants to see if they can nail it before we do, comment below. Let us know what you think. We'll see if uh, anybody can grab a hold, and episode two will be coming up one week from today.